Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 7025 in the name of Marie Todd on World AIDS Day. I would invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Marie Todd to speak to and to move the motion around 12 minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, it's a privilege to open this debate. debate. Today is a time of mixed emotions. First and foremost, it's a time to remember and to pay tribute to over 40 million people who have died of HIV and AIDS-related illnesses across the globe. We've become used to quoting fatality statistics and case numbers, especially over the last few years. And we've heard over and over that those numbers are not just numbers and that each represents a real person. Nonetheless, I will make that point again today. That is over 40 million people who didn't have the chance to reach their full potential, who left behind friends and families, and who all too often had to battle stigma and prejudice on top of a deadly virus. Those people must never be forgotten. And in paying tribute to them, I hope we focus not on their deaths, but on the lives that they led and on the courage that so many of them showed in fighting for a better future, even if they knew that they would never see it. And as we remember, and as part of our tribute to them, we should acknowledge that astounding progress has been made in diagnosing and treating HIV, and that that better future has at least in part become a reality. 40 years ago, an HIV diagnosis was effectively a death sentence. Today, it means daily medication or receiving an injection every two months. People with the virus are now able to live long, happy and healthy lives without even the fear of passing on the virus if they remain on effective treatment. To be clear, and this is not to downplay an HIV diagnosis, it can still have an adverse physical and mental health impact on an individual, and it requires in lifelong interventions to manage. But it is largely a chronic illness now, not the killer it once was. And that is in stark contrast to the outlook when I was an undergraduate pharmacist in the early 1990s. In Scotland, we've been working hard to prevent infection and to ensure that those living with HIV receive the treatment that they need. The number of new diagnoses in Scotland has been falling since 2017. And in 2018, we met the UN AIDS 90-1990 goals. That's 90% of people living with HIV know their HIV status. 90% of people with diagnosed HIV receive sustained antiretroviral therapy and 90% of people receiving antiretroviral therapy have viral suppression. All of this is hugely encouraging, but we cannot and must not think that the job of tackling this virus is done. We must instead set our sights on stopping HIV transmission. And while it may seem inconceivable to anyone old enough to remember the horror at the height of the HIV pandemic, that goal is absolutely possible. Of course, possible does not mean inevitable. It will require hard, dedicated work. We need to test more people. We need to work harder to find and connect with those people who are at risk. And we need to do all of that in the most challenging circumstances that our health service has ever faced. None of it can happen without a clear plan. That's why two years ago, the Scottish Government commissioned a proposal on how Scotland could become one of the first countries in the world to eliminate HIV transmission by 2030. Now, in practice, that means zero people contracting HIV in Scotland. Today, the Scottish Government welcomes that proposal, which was developed by the HIV Transmission Elimination oversight group. And as an aside, I am told that other longer names for that group were available. 
Before I go further, I want to extend my warmest thanks to Professor Rak Nandwani, who so ably chaired that group. I know it was no small feat to assemble the clinical, third sector and academic expertise needed to develop the plan. And I'm also grateful to all of those who made the time to participate. The proposal is wide-ranging, wide and all those who worked on it should be absolutely proud of its ambition. Time today doesn't allow me to do justice to the care and consideration that has gone into it, and I urge everyone in the Chamber to read it for themselves. But crucially, it has three high-level goals. Firstly, to prevent people from acquiring HIV, regardless of age, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, religion, deprivation or disability status. Secondly, to find people living with HIV, some of whom are still undiagnosed, and support them into HIV care and treatment. Thirdly, to help reduce the stigma that makes some people less likely to access HIV prevention, testing and treatment services. Now, I'm wholeheartedly in favour of reaching those goals, as I am absolutely sure is everyone involved in HIV care or prevention. However, the plan acknowledges that these are only achievable if organisations come together to make it happen, what it calls a whole system and a whole society approach. And that in itself is often easier on paper than in practice. And the scale of the effort required is demonstrated by the 22 recommendations that the plan set out, covering testing, education, prevention, contact tracing and HIV care. Presiding officer, it would be unwise in the extreme for me to pretend that all of these can be achieved immediately. However, the plan itself recognises the complexity of the task and also recommends an interim target on our journey towards transmission elimination. That interim target is that Scotland achieves and maintains the UN AIDS 95-95-95 goals by 2025. And I'm pleased to announce this government's commitment to that target. That is 95% of individuals with HIV have been diagnosed, 95% of those diagnosed are on treatment, and 95% of those on treatment have a suppressed viral load. I'll also take this opportunity to accept another of the recommendations within the proposal, that an implementation group is established to carry on the work needed to ensure that we reach our targets. This group will provide dedicated focus and accountability, while also ensuring that the proposal is taken forward in a careful, considered way that recognises the challenges currently facing our health services and our third sector. That's vital work, and I'm delighted to announce today that Professor Nicola Steedman, the Scottish Government's Deputy Chief Medical Officer, and Dr Dan Clutterbuck, Clinical Lead for HIV at the Chammer Centre, have agreed to chair the group. Now, these are clinicians with huge experience in the field, and I am profoundly grateful that they'll be taking this task on. It'll be for the group to develop a work programme, and I don't want to preempt that. But I have two further announcements today that I hope will demonstrate the Scottish Government's commitment to transmission elimination. The first is that we'll be funding a marketing campaign in recognition that increasing education and reducing stigma is a key pillar of the proposal. Now, that campaign will be developed by a range of partners, including third sector, academia, public health experts, and those with lived experience of HIV. And I expect to see its first outputs in the spring. I have heard often that the alarming and intentionally fear-driven campaigns of the 1980s have left a damaging legacy of stereotypes and misconceptions. And a campaign to address these is overdue. And I'm very pleased to be able to commit to that today. The second announcement is that we will provide a funding, uh, funding for a pilot of ePrep clinics. In 2017, 
Scotland was one of the first countries in the world to introduce an HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis service offering free preventative medication to those who were deemed at highest risk of acquiring HIV. To date, over 6,500 people have had PrEP prescribed at least once, and we've seen a significant reduction in new diagnosis of, gay, of HIV amongst gay and bisexual men in the four years since it was launched. And Certainly. Julie Martin. Has, uh, thank you very much. Uh, has there been an improvement in the number of women coming forward to access uh, PrEP? Minister. Well, one of the things that we're keen to do in an early action to support elimination efforts is to widen eligibility guidance so that anyone who's at risk can access PrEP and work to develop and roll out that guidance is well underway. That's very welcome news, but expanding that eligibility also puts additional pressure on already stretched services, which are alluded to in the Conservative Amendment. We can't address that overnight, but we do know there's huge potential for those who are able to largely manage their own care to request PrEP online and to carry out necessary tests in their own homes. And doing so could improve access to PrEP for those living in remote or rural areas whilst also freeing up clinical capacity for those who might have more complex needs or require more support. I have to stress that this is only a pilot and even if successful, it can't be a panacea. But it's an exciting development and if we can make it work in the long term, it has enormous potential to reduce inequalities, which I think is what my colleague was alluding to, to widen access and to lessen the burden on NHS services. Presiding officer, I hope what I have set out today conveys the genuine ambition that this government has to ending HIV transmission in Scotland by 2030. In doing so, I've tried to explain how challenging it will be. And in case I failed to do so, I'll say bluntly that the challenge is considerable. But I also know that the reward of success is greater. The prize here is huge. As I said at the start, it is measurable in lives saved. It is improved health. And it is overcoming the scourge of a stigma that has endured for too long. Today, I pledge this government's support for that. It is the greatest tribute that we can offer to all of those that we have lost. And I move the nation, motion in my name. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Could I just remind all those members seeking to speak in the debate to please ensure that they have pressed the request to speak buttons. I now call on Jamie Green to speak to and to move amendment 7025.2. Around eight minutes, please, Mr. Green. Uh, thank you kindly, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Minister for her opening comments? I'm going to reflect on some of those in my speech today. Members might recall last year um, I brought to the Chamber uh, members' business to celebrate or commemorate Mark World AIDS Day. I'm pleased that we're having it in government business. It gives us a frank and fulsome opportunity to debate some of these issues. In fact, my first debate on the subject was as far back as 2016 uh, after I was first elected when uh, Kezia Dugdale brought a very similar members debate to the chamber and I was pleased to participate. I actually read through some of my historic speeches that I've given in this chamber on this subject. I spoke in 2016 and 2018, last year and of course today and I read through some of those speeches with a slight glint of intrigue, uh, a little bit of sadness but also a little bit of hope as well and I'll come on to that today in my comments. That first speech in 2016, just a few short months into my new political life, I used phrases like chemsex and gym bunny steroid users, a little risky perhaps, it certainly raised the eyebrows of the official report and the broadcast people in the booths but do you know what, if we can't be frank and honest with each other in this chamber on a subject like this then what's the point of having a debate about it in the first place? We should never be afraid to challenge ourselves or the wider world. In 2018, of course, in the debate that we had in this chamber, the introduction of the U equals U phrase came into political uh, discourse. I remember recounting the horrors of the 1980s and some of the anecdotes that I had heard and personally uh, affected me, to be quite frank. Last year, of course, members might recall, I opened up 
can of worms my take on the anniversary of the passing of Freddie Mercury. And of course, we were discussing the very topical TV show, It's a Sin, which I have to say I still haven't watched to the end. And I struggled with how to go about today's speech to say something different, because this is a subject which is traditionally statistically very heavy. And statistics, of course, are important. We heard of a lot of them already. But behind stats are people, as uh, the minister rightly pointed out. And the situation in Scotland and across the UK is markedly better than it was 2016, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Our collective ambition, and it is a collective ambition, to eliminate new HIV infections by 2030 is not just an admirable one, it is an achievable one. Now, I'm not one often to praise the Scottish Government uh, standing at this podium, but actually the universal introduction of the availability of PrEP is exactly the sort of game-changing policy that we needed and has made such a difference because it has a very direct and immediate effect. Within the first four years of, of it being rolled out in Scotland, we saw a 43% drop in HIV diagnosis in men attending sexual health clinics. Just one second. Um, but I will come on to the point that that rise in demand has also meant a huge rise in pressure on health services. And that was true in 2018, I said it then, it was true last year and it's still true today, which is the whole point of my amendment today, which I do hope uh, members are willing to support. I'm happy to give way. Alex go Hamilton. Very grateful uh, to Jamie Green for giving way, and can I commend him on his excellent remarks? He always speaks so well on this subject, as he does on so many. Does he agree with me that the delays caused by the pressure he describes around accessing PrEP are causing potentially um, illness to, to spread, but also that actually the areas by which PrEP can be accessed are limited, and that we should consider expanding those, particularly for people who live outside of major metropolitan areas? Jamie Green. Yeah, you've preempted the next page of my speech. Thank you, uh, Mr. Go Hamilton. That's exactly the point I want to make. Um, I support calls made by many organisations, including Terence Higgins Trust, Waverley Care, HIV Scotland, and many others, to expand access to treatment and services, especially in rural, remote, and island communities. Now, I can't imagine that unenviable position of having to approach your local GP, who's probably a family friend or a neighbour and try and explain to them what on earth PrEP is or what it's for or why you think you need it because you think you're a high-risk person and saying all of that without sounding promiscuous or foolish. That's not a position I envy, but it is, I'm afraid, the position that many Scots are in today. Uh, for example, if you study at St Andrews, you have to travel to Glenrothes for sexual health services. How is that going to help increase testing and access to treatment. We don't all have the luxury or the pleasure of popping along to Chalmers or Sandyford where the brilliant staff there who will treat you with respect, with kindness, often a bit of humour as well. I've got absolutely no qualms in telling the Chamber I saunter off there for my regular checkups, even if I do get the odd knowing glance from the patrons sitting next to me in the waiting room. But of course, if you don't want to do that, you can do much of this at home. Uh, free HIV and STD kits are available. They're easy to use and they're free on demand. A few years ago, I actually uh, ordered one during COVID. Uh, in the absence of being able to attend clinics, I made a video of myself taking a home test and I chucked the video on Instagram. It absolutely warmed my heart when a few days later, I got an email from somebody to thank me for the video uh, because it had encouraged him to do the same. I don't know the outcome of that test, uh, but I can only imagine that it was an important test to him. And that's because we have to destigmatize uh, things like this. Knowing your status, we spoke about this before, is the first and most vital way to defeating this virus. When in doubt, test. It really is that simple. And if you're afraid to go for one, if you're afraid of the test or afraid of the outcome, then talk to someone. Talk to me, talk to any of us. I'll happily come with you, drop me an email, and we'll go along together because testing is vital. And of course, that U equals U campaign lives on today because we all know that undetectable means untransmittable. In this debate, we spoke many times about stigma and it's, I think it is getting better. The fact that we talk so freely and open in our national parliament about this issue means that we are addressing the issue of stigma. And yes, of course, governments can make moves to address that. For example, the recent uh, lifting the ban of HIV positive individuals on medication and those on PrEP can now serve in the military. We had the landmark ruling on the issue of uh, the blanket ban on uh, gay men and bisexual men donating blood. I don't think we went far enough, but we certainly made progress. But that 2030 goal will not be achievable unless we defeat the disease called stigma. 
and not just the disease called stigma, but that other one that I've frankly spoken about in this place, the disease of bigotry, which often fuels it. It's been 30 odd years since the Don't Die of Ignorance campaign. The question is, why has there not been a campaign since then, a national campaign, that is? We have made progress, but we cannot defeat this virus at home unless we are equally defeating it abroad. I want to raise a very specific issue, with your permission, Deputy Presiding Officer, if I have time, and that's my concern, that whilst the, the worldwide trend is of a 32% reduction in new HIV tr transmissions between 2010, 2010 and 2021, welcome reduction, in the Middle East and North Africa, there has been a rise of 33%. Now, we, speak, we spoke uh, for the last couple of weeks very publicly about LGBT rights in Qatar, for example, given the media attention on that, but no one's really questioning the reality that I'm sure there are people out there who are afraid to go for a test and afraid to seek treatment out of fear of retribution, prosecution, or even fear for their life. Political, religious, and societal pers persecution remains and it is fueling a rise in HIV transmissions in that part of the world. So given that there's so much media attention on it, perhaps we should use that opportunity to focus on that. This isn't just a job for governments, NGOs, charities, third sector, they've all got a role to play in this and I've got countless examples if I had the time I would share. All good stuff and all welcome. But I finished where I started and that's right back here at home. In Scotland we will not meet our 2030 target if we do not properly fund and resource local se sexual health services. I welcome the announcement today on a public awareness campaign. I look forward to more detail of what that might look like and how much it might cost. Let's get back on track with reliable data. It's very hard to source data about the subject at the moment, which is why I support Labour's calls for annual reporting. And of course, I know times are tough. I know money is tight, but we've come a long, long way on this. It is, now is not the time to take your foot off the pedal. That progress cannot and should not be in vain. I hope that one day, maybe, maybe even before I leave this place, we no longer need to have this debate on this day in this chamber. We don't need to have it because we've eliminate, eliminated new transmissions. We've met our target. I think we can do it. I really think we can, and I hope we can. I move the amendment in my name, signing officer. Thank you, Mr. Green. I now call on Paul O'Kane to speak to and to move Amendment 7025.1. Around six minutes, please, Mr. O'Kane. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm pleased and proud to have the opportunity to open this debate on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party as we mark World Aids Day 2022. And it is genuinely a pleasure to follow the Minister, who I know is very personally committed uh, in this area, but also Jamie Green, who I, I think has always spoke with uh, an openness and a frankness, uh, but also an integrity. Uh, and it is good to obviously hear his lived experience. I'm obviously younger than him, so it's always good to, to listen to him talk. Uh, but, but genuinely, I think what he says is, is important, and particularly in, in the sense of um, sexual health clinics. And it's why uh, we on these benches will support the Conservative Amendment today. Today, we remember those who have lost their lives from AIDS. We stand in solidarity with those living with HIV AIDS. And we commit to redoubling our efforts to eliminate HIV transmission, not only here in Scotland, but across the world, because we all stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before. Uh, and as, as so often said on World Aids Day, we remember the dead and we continue to fight for the living. Because we know that it is estimated that there are almost 7,000 people in Scotland living with HIV. And in recent years, we have made steady uh, progress with 92% of people living with HIV in Scotland being diagnosed, 90% of people attending specialist services and 95% of people accessing treatment reporting an undetectable viral load. However, we cannot be satisfied with improvements because although always welcome and every step we take is welcome, it is not job complete. It is very much still a work in progress. And I think we all recognise that today in the Chamber and want to redouble our efforts uh, to move forward. Um, as we have already heard, um, there has not been enough work done to widen access for PrEP to all areas of Scotland, uh, and that often results in, in sometimes a postcode lottery for treatment and access to things like uh, testing and, and drugs. 
Um, I think there's a particular issue in remote and rural communities where people living with HIV may be eligible for treatment but are simply unable to access PrEP because of their postcode. And we heard, I think, some of the challenges that exist uh, in Jamie Green's contribution as well. And I, I am pleased to hear that the Minister intends to take forward a pilot to address uh, some of these issues. And I do hope she will look at rurality uh, in terms of that pilot uh, and see how we can quickly get more people to be able to access services uh, online. In terms of education, um, there is clearly still stigma associated with uh, a diagnosis of HIV. Um, but at present, um, we must do more to really tackle outdated and very often homophobic myths, which I think continue to pollute the discourse in this space and have done over uh, many, many decades. And although we are far on from um, those, those darkest of days, it is clear that uh, this uh, discrimination persists. And, and I welcome the Minister's commitment um, to a, a large campaign to address these issues in, in the public discourse. Uh, and I look forward to receiving more information on that uh, and hopefully making a contribution as to how we, we shape and take that forward. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, in Scotland there are certain groups of people, of course, who are more at risk. That includes gay and bisexual men, people who inject drugs and people who uh, come from certain minority ethnic groups. And I think it would be utterly wrong, though, if we continued to allow uh, a stereotype to persist that HIV can only affect certain groups of people. Actually, I think we need to uh, continue to acknowledge that it can and does affect anyone. Um, I think that is clearly borne out in the most recent statistics, which actually show that in 2019, of the 176 new diagnoses of HIV, the likelihood of contracting HIV for men who have sex with men was only marginally higher than heterosexual transmission rates, with 37% of new diagnoses being among men who have sex with men uh, and 32% being uh, in heterosexual uh, relationships. I heard this uh, referred to by Jamie Green as well, and I think it's an important point. It's critical to remember that it was only last year that changes to blood donation rules uh, allowed gay and bisexual man men to give blood, which uh, began to rectify an outdated and deeply homophobic practice, which was the product of the moral panic around homosexuality and the HIV AIDS epidemic of the 1980s. And earlier this year, I was proud as um, Scottish Labour's first openly gay male uh, MSP to give blood for the first time since I was 17. Um, because it's undoubtedly the case that that historic change in the law has helped to tackle stigma uh, related to HIV AIDS. And it's clear we need to do more in that space uh, to continue that work. I know there is a consensus in this chamber to eradicate HIV transmissions by 2030. And to achieve the same, we must have important interim markers to allow us to assess progress on the journey to elimination by 2030. And that's why our amendment uh, today calls for the government to outline clearer timescales uh, as we work uh, to eliminate HIV. And I think we can learn from other governments in this regard. We know that um, there are plans elsewhere. Uh, in Wales, for example, the HIV Action Plan from 2023 to 2026 it uh, has, as an interim marker, um, put down some quite clear actions in terms of eliminating new HIV infections and improving quality of life and stigma. And I do welcome the commitments the Minister has made today because I think it is very helpful to all of us in this chamber in terms of the scrutiny of this work, getting it right and moving it forward, that we have the opportunity to look at how the concrete actions are going to follow through uh, and indeed how um, a lot of this work can be mainstreamed into the HIV elimination plan. Because we know that it's not enough to just focus uh, one day a year on these issues. It has to be something that we do week in and week out and day in and day out. And it should be a public health priority for the government, for this parliament, for our local authorities, and for all of us. Um, I welcome the Minister's commitment also um, to uh, set up the, uh, the group who will look at implementation. I think that is very welcome. And um, again, we will want to use our time in this parliament uh, in order to scrutinise that work. Uh, that is why in our amendment, we've called for that regular reporting to this parliament uh, so that we can all uh, have our say uh, on those issues. So in concluding, Deputy Presiding Officer, on this World Days Day, we must commit to moving the debate beyond good sentiment and warm words and focus on having clarity to deliver tangible actions on how we will eliminate HIV transmission in Scotland by the end of the decade, which we can do and we will do. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Payne. I now call on Alex Go Hamilton. Around six minutes, please, Mr. Go Hamilton.
Thank you very much indeed, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. It gives me great pride to rise from my party in uh, this debate. It is a great debate. I'm grateful to Marie Todd for bringing it to the Chamber today. And I get to hear these amazing speeches from the likes of um, Jamie Green and Paul Kane and the Minister herself. Um, and I think that people speak with real passion. They speak from experience and we can learn a lot. Uh, but more importantly, I think uh, that it brings us together as a Chamber, as the debate did in large part last night on the 16 days of activism. Around the world every year, um, Deputy Presiding Officer, thousands of people are still dying of this terrible condition. It's not gone away. Uh, last year alone, 650,000 people died from age-related illness, particularly in the areas of poverty in our world. It is a massive global health inequality that those, whilst there is life-saving um, and life-enhancing therapies available, that for all too many sufferers, they are not available. Some 1.5 million becoming newly affected with HIV last year as well. And we've heard that desperate statistic, that cruel symmetry of the past 40 years and the 40 million lives lost, a million lives for every single year that this um, disease has been manifest in our population. Today, Deputy Presiding Officer, we remember them. And Presiding Officer, it is also incumbent upon us to recognise the toll that HIV and AIDS still takes on those currently living with it, both around the world and here in Scotland. The threat of complacency looms ever-present when this comes to this issue. And Scotland has made great progress, don't get me wrong, we have made great progress in fighting the epidemic and we should rightly be proud of the role that we have all played as act in acting as a global leader in ending transmission. As we've heard several times, and I, I salute the government for this, that Scotland was one of the first countries in the world to make life-saving HIV medication PrEP widely accessible. <clears throat> it is absolutely vital in terms of allowing people to protect themselves from transmission. It is right that we acknowledge that process, but we shouldn't become complacent in, in so doing. Two years ago, the Scottish Government committed to ending all new HIV infection in Scotland by, 20, 20, by 2030. And while that was a welcome commitment today, Scotland risks being left behind other areas of the UK in driving the change that is needed to meet that target. In August last year, or rather this year, Scottish Liberal Democrat research revealed that patients in Lothian are being forced to wait more than eight months for access to PrEP. That's just not good enough. And we know that this medication is almost 100% effective in preventing the passage of HIV. It plays a huge important role in eliminating transmission in Scotland and long waits for treatment risk an increase in transmission and the spread of disease. And this year, patients have had to wait up to 260 days to receive medication with all patients, all patients now waiting a minimum of 90 days in Lothian. In 2018, I asked the First Minister why Lothian had the longest wait in the country for PrEP, and she promised to work with NHS Lothian to deliver the drug more quickly. And four years later, and not only is NHS Lothian still struggling to meet demand, delivery is now even slower. Deputy Presiding Officer, to, I will take an intervention, uh, intervention from Jamie Green. Jamie Green. Just returning the favour, Mr. Cole Hamilton. But I, I wondered if, um, if we might hear, hopefully, in summing up from the government benches, more about the pilot scheme that it might not just be rural and uh, island communities, but actually suburban and urban communities as well, where there is a very hefty waiting time to get appointments and to seek treatment or to get renewed treatment and testing. That hopefully the pilot will include people in cities, not just outside of them as well. Alex Cole Hamilton, give you the time back. As, I, um, as my intervention, I think, showed Jamie Green's next page in his speech, so too his intervention shows the chamber the next page in mine. So um, we must uh, compare notes before speaking in the future. But the, I think his point is well made, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think that um, this is a, a postcode lottery in some cases, that actually where you are, particularly if you're in areas of rurality, and let's remember that if you live in a small community, the access to intimate medical care care of this kind is it can be very difficult because everybody knows everybody else in small communities uh, but they may not know everything about your lifestyle and you may want to keep it that way so we need to find ways around that we need to find uh, ways of making this far more accessible and the Scottish Government must ensure that every health authority has the right staff support and the resources necessary to eliminate HIV transmission through preventative remedies like this um, from square one and presiding officer it's also vital that we acknowledge those living with HIV still face and I think Jamie Green was right to call it the disease of stigma 
it is a disease. Stigma blights so many aspects of our life. It blights so many people who are vulnerable in so many ways. But in HIV, I think it's still one of the worst. And um, it's discrimination. It's judgment based on their personal lives, their personal choices. And a 2019 poll by the Terence Higgins Trust found that public attitudes to HIV still remain largely outdated and out of step with scientific progress. What we know about transmissibility, non-detectable viral load. But yet almost half of respondents would say that they would feel uncomfortable kissing somebody um, who is HIV positive despite there being no risk of transmission from that person. Prejudice leaves many people with HIV feeling marginalised and excluded and their community, from their communities and can even have a negative impact on job opportunities. Stigma also fuels the transmission of HIV, as we've heard several times today, by acting as a disincentive for people to seek testing and, by extension, treatment. I will. I'll take a... Martin Whitfield. Martin Whitfield. Very grateful to Alice Cole Hamilton for taking an intervention on that point. Does he agree with me that there is great hope in the proposed advertising campaign from the government to try and attack this stigma right at its root and move us away from those horrible images that people still talk about of falling tombstones? We have moved on and so must the thinking. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very, I'm very grateful to Martin Whitfield for that intervention. I am delighted uh, that the Scottish Government intend to take this back to the public. Um, for, in large part, presiding officer, the, um, the sum total of what people know about HIV AIDS um, of younger generations may have been gleaned from that excellent Channel 4 uh, drama, It's a Sin. Um, and again, Martin Whitfield's right. Things have moved on. It is not um, a death sentence that it was in the 1980s. It, there are therapies and treatments that we need to um, bring out into the light to let people understand their risk, because people not, may not believe that they are actually in a susceptible group or an at-risk group um, and are therefore all the more exposed because of it. So I absolutely agree uh, with Martin Whitfield. We can't be complacent about this because those living with HIV can't afford us to be complacent. We must redouble our efforts and we must work towards a Scotland entirely free of HIV stigma with zero new HIV transmissions or deaths from AIDS-related illness. The technology that we have, the medical uh, care that we have available should make that uh, a material possibility. To that end, there is more the government should be doing. It should establish a, a national HIV testing week for Scotland, something which is already in place in England and Wales. And I wonder if the, the minister might address that specifically in her summing up. Work must also be done to significantly broaden access to PrEP, as Jamie Green and I have discussed in both of our interventions making it uh, far more accessible beyond specialist sexual health clinics, which can be difficult for some populations to access. It should be rolled out in GP clinics, community pharmacies, maternity and reproductive health services, because let us not forget, presiding, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, the increase among women. Um, presiding Officer, I'll close with the words of HIV activist Alex Garner, who said, I choose to be open about who I am because I understand that affirmatively declaring who I am to the world, where I, we continue to be marginalised and dehumanised, is a powerful term of resistance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Gill Hamilton. We now move to the open debate. I call first Emma Roddick to be followed by Brian Whittle uh, for around six minutes. Ms Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I first want to thank all the MSPs who turned up for the photo call that I was honoured to be able to sponsor earlier today to show support for Terence Higgins Trust, Waverley Care and National AIDS Trust and for Scotland's goal of eliminating new HIV transmissions by 2030 and, of course, to everyone who is wearing their red ribbons today. Today, over 40 years since the first cases were reported, is a very important one in the journey to eliminating HIV in Scotland. And I won't be alone in noting the significance of the Scottish Government's commitment to interim 95 targets and to some other recommendations in the HIV transmission elimination proposal. Being a member of the LGBTQI community and working closely with others who campaign on issues important to us, I've heard some horrendous, heartbreaking stories from around the world in the 80s. I've watched documentaries and dramas from that time with horror and uh, a miserable fascination. Pop culture often plays a very important role in raising awareness of social issues, particularly in cases like this where younger people may not have a good awareness of what happened during the AIDS epidemic. Russell T Davis' It's a Sin, a short TV series set during the epidemic, which was mentioned earlier by my LGBTI CPG co-convener, Jamie Green, who I also think did a, a fantastic job in demonstrating how we can all play a part in, in destigmatising HIV. 
is a great example of a drama which is accessible, has clear messages, but is also based on real experiences and true stories of what people went through and the stigma that they faced from friends, from family and from society. Russell T Davis himself has said that he is very aware that younger generations are growing up not knowing anything about this period. And we have to remember these stories. We have to be aware of the same patterns emerging. We have to help young people with HIV or still suffering the stigma that our whole community faces understand where that comes from, to arm them to challenge it, but also help them know that they're not alone and that it's not them who are wrong. Earlier this year, I heard some of the incredibly stigmatising media commentary from the AIDS epidemic and the kind of sentiments that were explored through characters in It's a Sin echoed in stories about monkeypox. And what were meant to be dramatised public reactions could be seen again almost word for word in tweets and Facebook comments under those stories. Yet again, people in the LGBTQI community were seen as disgusting, dangerous, risky, something to be avoided or someone you shouldn't touch. Too many people still believe the harmful misinformation that was spread before we understood what HIV and AIDS are. And too many don't know the difference, not just between HIV and AIDS, but between the HIV of reality and the HIV of scare stories. Science has brought us a long, long way since the 80s to a point where it is completely possible for us now with existing therapies and preventative measures to not just prevent AIDS, but to stop new cases of HIV. PrEP alone is almost 100% effective at preventing transmission and HIV positive people are living into old age with effective management of the virus. Most people with HIV in Scotland are now over 50. It is not a death sentence. You can have a normal lifespan and live a healthy life but society still has work to do to catch up with that medical potential. Presiding officer, I try not in contributions to, to make speeches that are too heavy on stats and reading out facts and numbers as if they're gonna go into people's heads, but I am gonna read three out here because they are incredibly important. Almost half of people surveyed in a Terence Higgins Trust poll said that they would be afraid to kiss someone who's HIV positive. There's no risk there, but that means someone who's HIV positive might have half the chance of just being kissed as someone else. And that goes up to 64%, almost two thirds, when it comes to people not being willing to have sex with someone who's on effective treatment for their HIV, preventing them passing on the virus. Most people with HIV will tell you that they face stigma because of their diagnosis. Terence Higgins Trust again revealed data this morning to mark World AIDS Day that showed 74%, nearly three quarters, of people with HIV say they've experienced stigma or discrimination because of it. The stigma and the lack of understanding of just how far we've come not only means that people are suffering from that stigma and discrimination, but that those at risk are missing out on the very thing that could prevent them ever catching HIV. The high uptake of PrEP amongst gay and bisexual men has seen a significant drop in transmissions amongst that group, but not so much in others because 97% of those accessing the drug through NHS Scotland are gay or bisexual men. We need to increase awareness of PrEP in other groups, and I was glad to hear the Minister talk about expanding eligibility and access. I know that many cis women, trans people, and non-binary people at risk of contracting HIV are completely unaware that PrEP is readily available to them, and for those medically transitioning, that it doesn't interact with their hormone therapies. We also know that black African women are more at risk and not taking up PrEP. So ladies and MBs, please look into PrEP if you are high risk and protect yourself. There are many places that you can go to get advice about preventing HIV and to be tested quickly and easily. Waverley Care operates throughout Scotland, including in the Highlands and Islands, offering free testing at regular drop-in clinics. Highlands Sexual Health also offer this testing service and advice in Skye, Wick, Aviemore and other locations, as does Nordhaven and Orkney, based at the Balfour. I know that the Minister, as a Highlands MSP who's previously represented the region herself, will, as I do, be keen to make sure that rural and island residents can and know how to access sexual health clinics. And I hope that the marketing campaign that she mentioned in her speech will reach our constituents, as well as those in urban areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Roberts. Uh, I now call Sandesh Gulhani um, to be followed by Joe Fitzpatrick uh, for around six minutes. Uh, Dr. Gulhani. 
Thank you. And I'd like to start with an uh, apology for needing to leave before closing speeches. Uh, I'd like to declare an interest as well as a doctor, and um, that's going to be quite obvious given what I say next. Um, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, it's actually a group of viruses called retroviruses, and they destroy a certain type of white cell in our bodies, the CD4 T cells. Common symptoms include malaise, myalgia, which is a muscle ache, headaches, diarrhea, neuralgia, which is pain across nerves, and rash. And it's important that we try to test people at this stage because finding out early means early treatment. After this phase, people become asymptomatic, which means they have no symptoms. And this phase can last for years. And eventually, this leads to AIDS. And AIDS is an acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And AIDS is actually a term that covers a range of infections and illnesses which result from a weakened immune system. But we don't ever need to reach AIDS. Those of us from a certain vintage will still remember one of the most petrifying health campaigns ever. In 1986, John Hurt's voice, a menacing Don't Die of Ignorance television ad, featuring a huge granite tombstone or a crass, warning the public of a newly deadly virus which anyone can catch from sex with an infected person. I remember that ad. I was six at the time, and it was terrifying. I still remember that black tombstone coming down. But I suspect that was the point of them. And the hard-hitting ads didn't exactly put people off having sex with new partners, but it did have a significant impact in trying to change behavior, particularly encouraging people to use protection and to get tested. The campaign's key messages was clear and stark. If you ignore AIDS, it could be the death of you. Every household in Britain received a leaflet with a warning. Anyone can get it, gay or straight, male or female. Already 30,000 people are affected. And in these days and those days uh, of posted letters, and I'm sure some of us, or most of us in the chamber remember that, uh, the Royal Mail marked envelopes with don't die of ignorance. Back then, there was little knowledge of this disease and no drugs to treat it with. The predicted death toll was terrifying. The UK government was told it could be millions and millions. Hospital wards could be filling up with dying young men. Yes. Alex oh, Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful uh, to Dr. Gilhani for giving way. He describes a terrifying time. I remember that myself. And the stigma was legion around that time. Um, there was a surge, a massive surge in infections in the 80s. But so too was there a, a surge in co-infections that people who had um, blood-borne viruses were contracting um, sometimes multiple different um, lifelong viruses at the same time. Does he, reckon, does he agree with me that the work we need to continue to do to tackle HIV and transmission in this country needs to be coupled with work on things like Hep C so that those communities who were co-infected are helped as well? Dr Gulhani. I, I, I very much do agree with you and we need to work hard at eliminating hepatitis C uh, and that's something that we spoke about last time in, in one of the debates. Uh, and so yes, I do agree. Um, back then, there was little sympathy for gay men a common and so unjust view was anyone with HIV had brought it upon themselves and should be left to their own fate. The stigma, the prejudice, the discrimination. HIV and AIDS was known as the gay plague. When I was at med school in the 2000s, we were taught about the devastating diagnosis of HIV. The fact was drummed into us before testing we had to counsel our patient. We had to talk about the implications of a positive diagnosis and get explicit informed consent because it could affect their health insurance, their life insurance, their travel insurance, just to name a few financial things. In London in the early noughties, people were still dying of AIDS. Later, as an orthopaedic uh, registrar in Birmingham, although infection controls were robust, there was still the perceived additional threat of occupational transmission from HIV positive patients. So just look at how far we have come. HIV is still a lifelong infection, but can be managed successfully by antiretroviral therapies or ART. There's no vaccine or cure for HIV, but taking daily tablets, the virus won't replicate and progress to AIDS. We now even have drugs to reduce the likelihood of becoming infected. For those who think they've been exposed to the virus, we have PrEP. And for those 
who are HIV negative but are in high risk HIV in infection groups, we have the pre-exposure prophylaxis medicine, which reduces this risk significantly. 30 years ago, HIV AIDS was a death sentence. Now the medical profession considers HIV as a chronic disease. In fact, the prognosis and life expectancy for a person living with HIV is better than someone living with type 2 diabetes. Living well with HIV usually involves taking a tablet per day, and that doesn't give you a reduction in your life expectancy. And despite how well you can control type 2 diabetes, there is a progressive disease and it's life limiting with the need to increase pharmacological therapies over time. It's estimated that 500 Scots are likely to be unaware that they are living with HIV. And there is evidence that some people are still being diagnosed at a very late stage. So on this World AIDS Day, while there is so much welcome regard, our knowledge of this disease and the advancement in the disease, treatment and management, there is still so much to do. The goal is to eliminate AIDS and have zero transmission of HIV by 2030. And testing is key. And well-functioning sexual health services are vital to this. But too many people are going undiagnosed, and that doesn't have to happen. Thank you very much, Dr Gulhani. I now call Joe Fitzpatrick to be followed by Claire Baker. Around six minutes, Mr Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like others, I want to start by remembering all those who've lost their lives to HIV and AIDS. Too many lives lost too early. Presiding Officer, there have never been more people living with HIV in Tayside than there are now. We see new diagnoses every, every year, but thanks to modern treatment, as we've heard from Dr Galhani, HIV-related deaths are rare. People living with HIV can <clears throat> continue, however, to experience disproportionate stigma and discrimination, which impacts on willingness to test for HIV or engage with treatment and prevention interventions. Ultimately, Stigma fuels the ongoing HIV epidemic in Tayside in Scotland and around the globe. Stigma has been a major feature in, in many of the contributions today, and I will come back to it to discuss stigma later in my speech. President Officer, I recently attended an event at Discovery Point in Dundee to hear more about plans to make Dundee a fast track city. Fast track cities is a global initiative which unites local leaders and organisations with the common goal of ending the HIV epidemic by building on and strengthening HIV programmes to accelerate a locally coordinated response which, respect, which reflects specific local needs. Committing to Fast Track Cities um, seeks to unite local leaders in Dundee and Tayside and link them to that network of like-minded leaders across the globe. Fast Track Cities initiative supports technical support, including uh, data and systems, opportunities to share best practice via connections with other Fast Track Cities, capacity building support and solutions for funding and resource mobilisation. With the support of Fast Track Cities, Scotland is on track to meet the UN AIDS target of elimination HIV by 2030. Sign Officer, Tayside was the first region in the world to effectively eliminate hepatitis C in 2019, 11 years before the World Health Organization's 2030 target. And there is a determination to also be the first to eliminate HIV transmission. Sign Officer, I want to highlight the, the work of the Tayside Sexual and Reproductive Health Services, including Dr Sarah Allstaff, consultant, GUM physician and clinical lead uh, for HIV. I know that Dr Alstaff, Alstaff and her team worked tirelessly during the COVID-19 pandemic to support people living with HIV. The COVID-19 pandemic had a unique effect on people living with HIV, often bringing back memories of stigma, contagion and contamination. And I know that the work of Fast Track Cities stalled during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm really pleased that certainly in Dundee that work is now progressing once more at pace. I want to also um, commend the work of Waverly Care and the Terence Higgins Trust. Waverly Care are leading on reducing new HIV and hepatitis C infections, getting people diagnosed, tackling health inequalities, promoting good sexual health, um, and, and, ch and crucially challenging that stigma. 
and Terence Higgins Trust, as members will know, have been supporting people living with HIV since the early 1980s, since those horrible ads that have, others have talked about. The Trust provides testing services for HIV and other sexually transmitted in infections and helps service users achieve good sexual health. The Terence Higgins Trust also highlights issues with stigma surrounding HIV. The Trust advises that stigma is often born out of fear and can take many forms, including hostility, physical or verbal abuse, and someone being avoided or excluded from activities that they used to take part in. And my, my colleague um, re reiterated some of the other um, impacts of stigma on, on people um, living with HIV. So whilst we all hope that one day there will be a, a cure for HIV, the actions we are taking right now mean that Scotland is on course to be one of the first countries in the world to eliminate transmission of HIV. In the meantime, it is crucial that we do everything we can to tackle that stigma, which is a remaining barrier. Stigma is the recurring theme of my speech and other speeches today. HIV does not discriminate, as we have already heard, and neither should we or anyone else. Members of, of, across the Chamber supported the Terence Higgins Trust's Can't Pass It On campaign, and I want to take this opportunity to again highlight the key message that people on effective HIV, HIV treatment cannot pass on the virus. 20 years' worth of evidence proves definitively that people living with HIV with an undetectable viral load cannot transmit HIV sexually. As Jamie Green and others said in their contributions, undetectable equals untransmittable. And I think that message, the message behind that phrase is worth repeating. People on effective HIV treatment cannot pass on the virus. Presiding officer, I'm delighted that Dundee is to become a fast track city and I'm confident that we can learn from the ongoing fantastic words works in other cities across Scotland and around the world. On World AIDS, AIDS Day 2020, I stated that the goal of eliminating HIV transmission was in sight. Two years on, I believe that remains the case. But let me be clear, irrespective of the progress that we have made in recent years, as the Minister said in her opening, elimination is not inevitable, but it is achievable. Presiding officer, by working together, Scotland can and I believe will eliminate HIV transmission by 2030. And the Minister's three significant announcements today will support that ambition. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick. I now call Claire Baker to be followed by Evelyn Tweeding in around a generous six minutes. Okay, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, it is four decades on from the first diagnosed cases of HIV. And World AIDS Day provides an important opportunity to stand with those living with, those affected by HIV today, and to remember the millions of lives that have been lost to HIV and AIDS. So here in Scotland, as we've heard this afternoon, we have made huge advances in that time, including being one of the first countries to make PrEP widely accessible. But we know that more concerted and continued action is needed if the goal of zero new transmissions by 2030 is to be met. While we welcome the progress being made in the fight against HIV, there remain challenges which must be addressed both holistically and specifically if we are to succeed. And so with cross-party backing for plans to end new HIV cases within the decade, the challenge for the Scottish Government is determining the route to get there. Our amendment today calls for a commitment to annual reporting to Parliament on progress. But we also need to see action such as a more proactive approach to HIV testing, wider access to PrEP, public education and work to address HIV stigma and HIV health inequalities, particularly among people who are intravenous drug users. It is vital that the Scottish Government's drug strategy takes into account the risk of HIV transmission among populations who inject drugs in Scotland. So data on routes of transmission for first diagnosis of HIV recorded in 2020 shows that 17% were linked to people who inject drugs. Of those living with HIV up to December 2019, the route of transmission linked to people who inject drugs was 9%. When we think about the risks of drug use, transmission of HIV and other blood-borne viruses must be part of that discussion so we can address it within the broader action that's been taken. And when we consider... Um, Alex Cole-Hamilton. 
I'm very grateful to Claire Baker uh, for giving way on that point. Um, she makes a very compelling uh, argument about the link between inter intravenous drug use and HIV transmission. And, and does she agree with me that um, we have seen, we saw an HIV outbreak in, in Glasgow when services were cut to ADPs, or rather funding was cut to ADPs, and that underscores why we need to fund, adequately fund, on the ground drug services in our country. Claire Baker. Um, thank you. That is, you know, it's an excellent point. It's a point I made in last week's debate that we had um, on stigma um, within in the, the, the drug strategy. Sorry, was I not saying? Was it not me you were indicating to? Not sorry, that was. A... <laughs> uh, so yeah, as I say, it's a point that I made last week. That we need to make sure that community, while we have centralised our drug and addiction services, that does lead to good medical outcomes. There needs to be more locally delivered provision because that's where people look to access their provision. Um, and I argued around more provision within GP services. Um, so back to the issue of uh, drug-related deaths. If we look at our record on drug-related deaths, we should also look at the number of individual lives lost which were related to HIV and hepatitis C. The uh, NRS drug-related death publication for 2021 shows that between 2010 and 2021, there were 413 deaths resulting from hepatitis C or HIV, which are not included within the definition of drug misuse deaths, but may be associated with uh, present or past drug use. So harm reduction measures have a key role to play in reducing HIV and other bloodborne viruses with the effective delivery of the MAT standards important in ensuring this. Standard 4 in the MAT standards includes provision related to access to harm reduction services at the point of MAT delivery, including injecting risk assessments and BBV testing. Service providers will be required to have a procedure in place to offer testing for HIV and other BBVs. But as we know, implementation of MAT standards has slipped, with full implementation of Standard 4 only in place in eight D ADPs areas where the progress report was carried out. So full delivery of this standard will only happen if the services are properly developed and funded, and they must meet the target of delivery by next April. We talk about safer drug consumption facilities primarily in terms of preventing overdoses, but they do also reduce the risk of HIV hepatitis C by providing people with a safe space to inject and reduce needle sharing. Although we still await for these kind of facilities to be operation in Scotland, and I understand a submission has been made to the Crown Office for a facility in Glasgow, but it is disappointing that three years after the declaration of a public health emergency, we still don't have a pilot facility up and running in Scotland. The joining up of policy and service delivery is vital in our fight to eradicate HIV transmission. We have seen the benefits of collaborative working to prevent blood-borne viruses among people who inject drugs carried out by Public Health Scotland. Recognising that people who inject drugs are disproportionately affected by BBVs and the challenges of tailoring interventions to reduce the health inequalities faced by this group, Public Health Scotland worked with NHS boards, third sector organisations and other key partners to design and implement monitoring and evaluation initiatives. And the needle exchange surveillance initiative supported by the Scottish Government is an example of data gathering to support better intervention and is the kind of action we need to see more of. Um, so last week, as I said, I spoke in the uh, debate on stigma and the importance of addressing stigma within drugs policy, and this too is vital to today's debate. Knowledge and understanding of HIV among the public is still too low, and much more needs to be done to end stigma and discrimination around HIV. There hasn't been a major public information campaign about HIV since the 1980s Don't Die of Ignorance messages, and data released this summer by the Terence Higgins Trust showed that public attitudes for many are still tied to this campaign, particularly among older people. And I welcome the Minister's announcement this afternoon about an upcoming campaign. Um, with others, I would like to see more detail on that, but it's positive a campaign is, is forthcoming because just 38% of those surveyed knew that people living with HIV on effective treatment cannot pass it on to partners. And the same survey found that just 30% of respondents would be comfortable dating someone living with HIV and on effective treatment. So there remains a disconnect between knowledge about HIV transmission and the impact on how people living with HIV are perceived and treated, and the government does have a role to play in addressing this. So a new campaign should help address stigma by informing the public about the realities of HIV, encourage more people to get tested and provide better support for those living with HIV. So if we are to successfully end HIV transmission in Scotland, we cannot do so by thinking about it in isolation. For individuals who inject drugs, the risks of harm are interlinked and need to be addressed by looking at them holistically. 
The implementation of the MAT standards can help play a key role in ensuring server providers are able to engage with at-risk groups, but we have also waited too long for this to take effect. Improving public information is essential to reducing stigma, and working collaboratively across age agencies will help reduce the inequality and in provision of support and reach those groups that too often can be missed. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, Ms. Baker. I now call Evelyn Tweed to be followed by Gillian Mackay for around seven, uh, six minutes. Uh, Ms. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and apologies uh, to the Chamber for my lateness today. It felt like a death sentence, the words of my constituent who supported his partner through an HIV diagnosis in the 90s. The diagnosis was kept under wraps amidst a great deal of discrimination. Thankfully, my constituent was keen to highlight the enormous progress that has been made since his partner's diagnosis, with many public figures now openly sharing their status as HIV positive. Today, on World AIDS Day, we remember the millions of lives lost globally to HIV and AIDS. It's also an, important, it's also an opportunity to stand in solidarity with those living with HIV and reflect on the progress made. In 2018, Scotland met UNAIDS' 1990 target, with 91% of people living with HIV diagnosed, 98% of them accessing treatment, and 94% of them with an undetectable viral load. And sorry for some of the statistics, we've already talked about that today, but they're important. Once again, the Scottish Government is showing an ambitious approach to tackling health issues, and I welcome the Scottish Government's announcement today. Treatments for HIV are now very effective and free HIV testing is available in the NHS to anyone. Pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, as we've already heard, is a medication for people who do not have HIV is almost 100% effective in preventing transmission. And I commend the Scottish Government for making PrEP available in the NHS. It's the first nation in the UK and one of the first in the world to do so. However, social attitudes, as we've heard in the Chamber today, lag behind medical advances. Misconceptions of HIV risk are still abound. In 2020, HIV Scotland found that 31% of Scots believe they are not the type of person who can get infected with HIV. Only 17% believe that medication can prevent HIV infection. If Scotland is to reach zero transmission by 2030, outdated myths need to be overcome. And I welcome the Minister's comments on a new awareness campaign. Since PrEP has become more widely available, the demographics of new diagnosis have shifted. Those being diagnosed are more likely to be women, black African, and have acquired HIV outside of Scotland. However, from July 2017 to June 2019, less than 1% prescribed for PrEP were women, and only 0.4% identified as African or African Scottish, despite this being an at-risk group. Black African and Caribbean women living in the UK report low levels of knowledge around the benefits and effectiveness of PrEP. This results in low take-up and little change in rates of diagnosis. This study also highlighted the importance of peer networks for information on sexual health for this group. In a 2021 study, HIV-positive asylum seekers and migrants in Scotland reported feeling stigmatised by public health services. However, they described overwhelmingly positive experiences with dedicated services such as the African Health Project at Waverley Care. I look forward to hearing how the government will support people of colour, migrants and asylum seekers through diagnosis, treatment and prevention. Scotland has been able to show that PrEP has and can continue to have a powerful population level effectiveness. On World AIDS Day, I am so happy to hear the positive progress that we're making and to hear my fellow parliamentarians speak about their own experiences. 
We have moved on so much from the dark days of the 80s, the adverts with foreboding music showing tombstones that I remember as a teenager, and the fear that everyone felt. Scotland is already well on the way to zero transmissions by 2030, and I welcome the Scottish Government's announcements today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Tweed. I now call Gillian Mackay to be followed by Brian Whittle for, a, again, a generous six minutes. Ms. Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would like to begin by expressing my condolences to everyone who has lost someone they love to AIDS. I also want to give my thanks to all of the activists who have led and who continue to lead the fight for better treatment, diagnosis and understanding of HIV and AIDS. We would not be where we are today without their efforts, often made at great personal cost. Huge medical advancements have been made in the decades since HIV was first discovered, and it is now a very treatable disease. However, access to diagnosis and treatment is still not equitable, both globally and in Scotland. Inequality drives risk and creates barriers to diagnosis and treatment across the world. 70% of new HIV infections are among people who are marginalised and often criminalised. According to the World Health Organisation, division, disparity and disregard for human rights are among the failures that allowed HIV to become and remain a global health crisis. We cannot make those same mistakes. We can only end HIV transmission by scaling up HIV services, removing structural barriers and tackling stigma and discrimination worldwide. These structural barriers are evident in Scotland. To take an example, the current HIV outbreak in Glasgow is closely linked to widening health and social inequalities faced by people who inject drugs, including poverty and deprivation. Analysis of the outbreak by Public Health Scotland found that none of the deaths associated with the outbreak were from an AIDS-related illness. However, people who inject drugs face a range of inequalities that increase their risk of HIV infection and their rate of mortality such as homelessness and poor access to health care. These factors interact in complex ways, presenting significant barriers that prevent people from staying well. The Scottish Greens believe that action to address underlying health inequalities will help to reduce drug-related deaths, as well as related harms like HIV infection. Alongside tackling underlying inequalities, we also need to ensure it is as easy as possible to test for HIV. Vulnerable people who may be at increased risk can be labelled as difficult to reach, but in reality, testing is not always accessible. Early diagnosis is crucial to ensuring people with HIV can live the healthiest lives possible. However, according to the most recent statistics from Waverley Care, three out of every 10 HIV cases are being diagnosed late. Their analysis states that access to HIV testing can be impacted by structural barriers such as capacity, time constraints, lack of knowledge about how to obtain a test, low perceived risk of HIV infection, as well as fear of a positive test result or issues around disclosure. Absolutely. Jamie Green. Can I thank the member for taking my intervention? Does the member think there may be some merit or benefit to, for example, an idea proposed like a national HIV testing week? with a huge countrywide rollout of mobile testing, home testing uh, and in-clinic testing in one specific identified week that maybe find some of those 500 undiagnosed people. That would go a long, long way to uh, reduce cases in Scotland. Julian Mackay, and give you the time back. Thank you. Could I thank the member for the intervention and absolutely agree with him. And I would challenge everybody that if that does become a, a thing, that we in this chamber are the ones that make sure everybody sees that we get tested to and break down some of that stigma. I am aware that although not, not directly related, the current protests outside abortion clinics, which are often on the same sites as sexual health clinics, is putting people off getting tested for fear of being recognised. But I would like to echo Jamie Green's calls to get tested, or if you're frightened, could I join him in offering to go with those who are concerned? Additionally, people who live in rural or remote areas of Scotland may be discouraged from getting tested, as it can be difficult to maintain anonymity in rural communities, where simply accessing HIV testing services may expose HIV status. It can also be costly to travel to get tested if facilities are located far away. If we are to improve care for people with HIV and achieve zero transmissions by 2030, we need to ensure everyone who has contracted HIV is tested and diagnosed. 
Initiatives such as HIV self-sampling tests will play an important part, but we must explore other options to widen access. The Terence Higgins Trust is advocating for expanded opt-out HIV testing in healthcare settings, and the HIV Commission's flagship recommendation is that opt-outs rather than opt-in HIV testing must become routine across healthcare settings, starting with areas of high prevalence. I was pleased to see the government's commitment in the ending HIV transmission by 2030, but around the world we have already seen the difference opt-out testing can make. In around the year 2000, opt-out HIV testing was implemented in maternity services with a take-up of more than 99%. This innovation has become mainstream and has eliminated transitions of HIV from mother to baby. Subsequently, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence published guidance in 2016 which stated that in areas of high and extremely high prevalence, they recommended HIV testing on admission to hospital, including emergency departments, to everyone who has not previously been diagnosed with HIV and who is undergoing blood tests for another reason. According to the Tennis Higgins Trust, the initial findings of the three months of opt-out testing in England found that 102 people have been newly diagnosed with HIV and 60 people have been reconnected to an HIV clinic. There have also been 328 new hepatitis B diagnoses, as well as 137 new hepatitis C diagnoses. Piloting a similar approach in Scotland could be a vital way of ensuring that no one is left behind in Scotland's response to HIV. Along with improving access to testing, we must continue to tackle stigma, as we have heard from across the chamber this afternoon. It still prevents a very real barrier to diagnosis and treatment. People receiving antiretroviral medication can reach an undetectable viral load, which means that they cannot pass on HIV to anyone else within six months of beginning treatment, and this is incredible progress. However, knowledge of HIV has not kept up with medical advancements. At the risk of being booed by colleagues, I do not remember the Do not Die in Ignorance campaign. <laughs> Thank you. I wasn't born until the early 90s, but I grew up in a time where there were many myths about HIV, several of which persist today. That is why it is so important that we raise awareness of improved treatments and what having an undetectable viral load actually means. The Terence Higgins Trust's Can't Pass It On campaign aims to spread this simple message. Someone living with HIV and on effective treatment can't pass it on. Raising awareness of this reduces the stigma around HIV and is a positive message which encourages people with HIV to stay on treatment to keep both themselves and their sexual partners healthy. The more people who test and start effective treatment, the fewer HIV transmissions will happen. To conclude, Presiding Officer, I would like to welcome all of the interventions the Minister has announced today and look forward to seeing the impact they have. World AIDS Day is an important reminder that HIV has not gone away. An estimated 38.4 million people live with HIV, and each year in the UK, over 4,139 people are diagnosed with the disease. Access to diagnosis and treatment is not equitable, and stigma is still a reality in many people's lives. We must continue to widen access to diagnosis and treatment, increase awareness, fight prejudice, and improve education. Thank you, Ms Mackay. I'm going to check standing orders to see what it says about gratuitously flaunting youth, but there you go. Um, I, I'm going to call Brian Whittle to be followed by Richard Leonard. A, a generous six minutes, Mr Whittle. Thank you, Deputy President Officer, and I promise I won't fall into that category. Um, I am delighted to once again be speaking in this debate and, and to follow some really excellent uh, contributions to this debate. And, and I'm just struck by how far we've actually come. And I'm, I, this is where I am going to show my age, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, remembering those who actually have changed the conversation around AIDS and HIV and those who have helped to reduce stigma. I'm going to mention Freddie Mercury here, of course. He was one of the first people, really, that, that uh, of note that we uh, that we led we, we found out that had uh, had AIDS, and then my, my the, the great uh, uh, bas American basketball player Magic Johnson, who remained uh, an elite spo uh, sports condition, went to the Olympics and was part of the American Dream Team, and so sport and rock music uh, 
uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, you know I will always get that in whenever I can. But these, these people are, are, were heroes to so many uh, and in the public eye and really brought uh, uh, the reality of age to us. The Welsh rugby player Gareth Thomas, who in 2019 announced he was HIV positive, and it was a BBC documentary, Gareth Thomas, HIV and Me, aired shortly afterwards. And they timed that announcement to coincide with his taking part in an Ironman triathlon. It was carefully orchestrated media campaign to drive home a very simple message. HIV didn't weaken him. He was in control. His life was not over. I don't know if we all remember um, when Princess Diana uh, visited Terence uh, Higgins Trust and shock horror shook hands with people who were HIV positive. These are the people that I think began that change, began to change the way in which we view HIV and started to tackle uh, that stigma. And then Nicola Polacek served as chair of HIV Scotland in 2020, told of her experience as a woman living with HIV for most of her adult life. She reminds us that anyone can acquire an HIV infection. It's not limited to a subsection of people as we used to believe and as we used to be told. World AIDS Day was the first ever Global Health Day. Um, and uh, 31st of December 2021, a total of 6,415 people were living with HIV in Scotland. And as my colleague uh, Jamie Glean uh, has spoken so eloquently on, um, I agree with his uh, assertion that access to better sexual health services is vitally important in the fight against HIV. But so too is education and access to that public health service, such as drug and alcohol treatments. There are many people living with HIV who are not acknowledged in the public eye, such as those battling addiction or those who are homeless. These populations can often be difficult to reach, resulting in substantial health inequalities. And I'm proud to rock the ribbon as part of World AIDS Day 2022 campaign as an HIV ally this year to, to, to those who are often overlooked. And we need to look at the public health programmes. I think the needle exchange programme and, and, and general funding for drug and alcohol partnerships more gently, generally is underfunded. Between June 2014 and December 2020, 188 new diagnoses of HIV infection were de uh, detected among people who injected drugs in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde as part of an ongoing outbreak. This was the largest HIV outbreak among people who injected drugs in the UK in more than 30 years. And I think it's not a coincidence at that point there was a reduced needle exchange programme. And levels of reported needle and syringe sharing in the past six months have increased from a low of 7% in 2015-16 to 11% in 2019-20. So we have to be cognizant of that and understand the, the part that the needle exchange programme will, will play in this. Now, I welcome the fact that the number of AIDS diagnoses in Scotland is declining. And during 2021, a total of 218 reports of HIV diagnosis were report recorded in Scotland, compared to 326 reports in 2019. However, late diagnosis continues to persist, and it is vitally important that we continue to educate and provide that outreach. Although the proportions of first-ever diagnosis recorded as late have decreased in the past two years during the COVID-19 pandemic, there is evidence that some people are still being diagnosed at a very late stage of HIV infection. It is concerning that individuals diagnosed at a late or very late stage of infection have an eightfold risk of dying within one year of the diagnosis. And often response to treatment and therapy is poor, increasing concerns about quality of life during the last months. Testing remains a key public health priority for all risk groups to reduce the number of undiagnosed infections, identify individuals early in HIV infection when they can benefit from the most effective antiretroviral therapy and reduce the potential for onward transmission. Public Health Scotland notes that challenging during COVID-19 recovery is to re-establish and improve opportunities for testing in primary care settings and across all medical specialities, in addition to home and self-testing options. And I would further argue that raising public awareness is also important, as Jamie Green uh, made in his, in his intervention, so that the, the public knows their risk factors and knows what help is available. I would like to say in East Ayrshire there were 52 estimated cases, in South Lanarkshire there were 577 uh, cases, but in Lanarkshire, North Lanarkshire Council, South Lanarkshire Council, NHS Lanarkshire and Lanarkshire Bloodborne Viruses Network have created a partnership 
to address HIV and hepatitis, both of which uh, I, I think we recognise we could eliminate. And that joined-up approach ensures that these services are accessible to the young and old alike, as well as patients and medical providers. Now, research into pharma and treatments will uh, obviously be extremely important. PrEP is a drug taken by HIV-negative people before sex that reduces the risk of getting HIV. It continues to be particularly effective prevention intervention and the monthly average number of individuals accessing the service for the first prescription between July and December 2021 was the third largest, uh, largest observed since the first year of the programme. However, on representation of some groups who may benefit from PrEP, for example, women must be tackled to ensure equality of access to the PrEP service. I will uh, bring my comments uh, to a, a, a close, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, just to once again thank, thank, be thankful for the opportunity to speak in this programme, uh, in, in, this, in this particular debate. And of course, there's an awful lot of work to do. And if we have the will, we can eliminate this virus by the target of 2030. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Whittle. I now call Richard Leonard to be followed by Gillian Martin again around six minutes, Mr Leonard. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, we, we've heard a lot in recent weeks in this Parliament about the founding principles of the NHS. Well, we need to apply those founding principles of our National Health Service to the global community's fight against international and intergenerational pandemics. That means we need to get medicines to people according to need, not according to wealth. That's what we need to do to those who are ill, not those who can afford to pay. And it must be fully funded, paid out of general taxation, not to enhance the profit margin and the shareholder dividend, but to enhance universal life expectancy and the humanitarian dividend. Because people must be the assets on our balance sheet. Those are the principles of an iron bevan. Those are the principles we should stick to today. And there is another principle, an article of faith, which guides me and many others, although I recognise it may be a minority view in this parliament, which was best set out by Tom Mann, who a century ago wrote, no narrow nationalism can satisfy our people. Nothing short of cosmopolitanism can really satisfy a world citizen. The world is my country, is the declaration of every socialist. So I view the world crisis in AIDS as my crisis. I view it as all of our crisis, which is why we must all work to harness science, to get the most advanced, the most effective medicines without frontiers to those who need them. Because the prevention and treatment of HIV AIDS is a human rights issue. When private companies take over public health, profit becomes dominant over need and you have a two-tier system. The corollary of the corruption of power, which we see with the super profits and racketeering of Big Pharma, is the corruption of powerlessness. So we need more democracy in this global approach, an organised people's counterweight to the power of organised big business. Big businesses like Gilead Sciences. Last year, they generated $27 billion in turnover, settled a one and a quarter billion dollar patent infringement case with one of their main rivals, Vive Healthcare, majority owned by GlaxoSmithKline, and still managed to pay its CEO and chairman, Daniel O'Day, over $19 million. Last year, the theme of World AIDS Day was end inequalities, end AIDS, end pandemics. This year, the warning is to end dangerous inequalities. But we know that this lies at the root cause 
of a still rising number of cases in certain parts of the world. New infections are going up among women, among adolescent girls and young women especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Girls are three times more likely to acquire HIV than boys of the same age. And I have to say to Conservative MSPs, this debate this afternoon is in the end about inequalities of wealth, but it is also about the inequalities of power as well. Because what is happening out there globally is that while people with wealth survive, people in poverty are dying. According to the United Nations last year, children accounted for only 4% of all people living with HIV, but for 15% of all AIDS-related deaths. So the cuts to overseas aid, the cuts to organisations tackling AIDS globally, the cuts to the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, beg these questions on World AIDS Day 2022. Where is our sense of injustice? Where is our moral outrage? Where is our adherence to a civilised code of human rights, let alone of children's rights in this? UNAIDS Executive Director Winnie Bianyama is absolutely right to say this week, and I quote her, what world leaders need to do is crystal clear. In one word, equalise. Equalise access to rights. Equalise access to services. Equalise access to best science and medicine. Equalising will not only help the marginalised, it will help everyone. If all right-minded people challenge prejudice and stigma head on, take action so that there is no place for the profit motive and the shareholder dividend in this humanitarian quest. Recognise that silence is a vice and show real international leadership, then there is hope for a better future. We can break the link between corporate power and global poverty. We can end not only the dangerous inequalities, but the very pandemic itself. That is the task facing us in this generation. We can begin by setting a clear timetable in Scotland with a route map and annual reporting. We can make sure that resources are guided, not by profit, but by need. And we can truly be, in the Tom Mann sense, citizens of the world. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Laird. Uh, I now call Gillian Martin, who is the final speaker in the open debate, for around six minutes. Ms Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I too am glad that the Government has uh, made time for, to hold a, a Government uh, debate on World AIDS Day, because it does allow us um, that little bit more time to amplify the, the key aims of the National AIDS Trust, to work tirelessly to promote the information people need to prevent new cases of HIV, to secure the rights of people living with HIV, and crucially fighting against the HIV stigma and discrimination and it also gives us a chance to let our constituents know what services are out there and to highlight the importance of testing and HIV Scotland make it easy for anyone who's worried that they, they may have the virus to get tested quickly and uh, they, they can send self-testing kits and they can be delivered in discreet packaging to their home and signpost them uh, to people to other forms of support. Um, and I was pleased to hear the, the Minister's uh, determination to get more people tested. We've certainly come a long way in the decades since HIV and AIDS entered the public consciousness. And of course, the strides in clinical treatment are a huge part of that. And having HIV is now a condition that's treatable and manageable. Well, those receiving a diagnosis can expect to live long, healthy lives with managed care. And that extraordinary headway that has been made uh, and how the virus is seen by society is due in large part to the bravery of, of people who've come before us uh, in speaking out and to, to organisations like HIV Scotland and Waverly Care, uh, making massive contributions to tackling stigma. Although stigma does remain, and it's concerning, it was concerning to read yesterday in the Herald newspaper, a piece by Grant Sugton, the, the CEO of Waverly Care, who said that in a recent survey by the National AIDS Trust, only a third of people surveyed agreed that they'd have sympathy for anyone with, living with HIV. I found that really quite staggering and, and really depressing. It seems that um, from that response, that HIV is still associated with 
pr promiscuity or behaviours that lead people to, uh, to think that contracting HIV is the fault of the person with the disease or pointing to some kind of moral failure. I and mean, those damaging and hurtful stereotypes persist. And, and I do think of the, the dreadful Die of Ignorance campaign in the 1980s with its sinister voiceover uh, images of terrifying icebergs and tombstones and ridiculous scaremongering messaging really was at the root of many of those problems that are around stigma that we still see today. And it's great to hear the Minister commit to a new public messaging campaign. But apart from that campaign being completely and utterly useless at giving any public health information, it was hugely stig st uh, stigmatising and set the public discourse, which very quickly became deeply homophobic and actually um, anti-public health. From the survey that Mr Sutton cites, it seems that the legacy of that campaign remains and, and it does stop people from coming forward for testing and blinds them to how the, the virus is actually spread. Um, and I want to echo Emma Roddick's points about HIV prevention drug PrEP, which is currently almost exclusively accessed by, by men with HIV. But in, in, the, in the first eight months, sorry, men, men at risk from HIV, in the first eight months during which PrEP was available in Scotland, only 10 out of the 1,299 people who accessed the drug were women, which begs the question, are women, women not coming forward? And if not, why not? And that's why I intervened in the minister like I did in her speech. But of course one of the aims of the National AIDS Trust is to completely eradicate um, HIV and declining cases in Scotland and the wider UK are obviously hugely welcome. But despite the progress that we've made in preventing, treating and managing HIV over here, the illness is still a critical public health issue in other parts of the world, particularly in the Global South. And I have to say I have massive sympathy for the speech, everything that was mentioned in Richard Leonard's speech in that regard. One in 21 heterosexual African women are living with HIV. And UNICEF has reported that globally a child was infected with HIV every two minutes. And the estimated, of the estimated 2.7 uh, million children living with HIV over the world, um, just, just half of them are receiving uh, anti, antiretroviral treatment, meaning that others are going to have a, a very short life expectancy. And the figures on how many children in sub-Saharan Africa are orphaned due to AIDS uh, is, is similarly frightening and point to the pover poverty and inequality has been the main driver for that ongoing public health crisis. We're managing it here in the UK. Things are an awful lot better than they were. But as Richard Leonard says, there's other countries that aren't managing it and they need assistance from Big Pharma, I think, uh, and, and from governments who are managing it successfully. And it just goes to show that we can never rest in the fight against HIV and we should never make outdated assumptions about who can be infected. Nearly 40 years on from the discovery of HIV, we know so much more about the vi virus. We know that people with access to health care can live with it. But we also know it's a, a diagnosis that's still rife with stigma. And some demographics in Scotland, they might still be hard to reach when it comes to testing and treatment. But as long as HIV infection remains a problem anywhere in the world, we must talk about it and act, actually act, to eradicate it in countries that don't have the access to health care or public health messaging that we do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Martin. We now move to the wind-up speeches, and I call Carol Mochin for around six minutes. Ms. Thank you, Deputy Thank Presiding you. Officer. And can I join all my parliamentary colleagues in marking World AIDS Day this year uh, in the, the Chamber tonight? In closing for Scottish Labour, I would also like to take this opportunity to remind those at home and abroad who are no, who, to remember those at home and abroad who are no longer with us, having lost their life to this terrible disease. The work we must continue should always be done with them in mind. And I uh, bring back Jamie Green's reminder that behind statistics, there are always people and their families. The ongoing battle against AIDS is a remarkable story for cooperation in research and development that has had a positive effect uh, in the world, um, or at least here in Scotland. And I will come back to the points made by Gillian Martin and Richard Leonard later. The government motion correctly commends the work of those who have ensured we have vastly reduced the number of HIV diagnoses across Scotland, a feat that I have no doubt will continue for years to come. But the intended goals cannot stop there. 
Um, can I say at this stage that, uh, as my colleague has said, we will be supporting the uh, Tory amendment uh, about the access uh, to sexual health services um, and that it should be timely and that it's important that we move forward to make sure that treatments and prevention strategies are at the front of, of all our policy making. I want to at this point also talk a wee bit about um, some of the points made by other colleagues about rural inequality, making sure that we do look at that. And the, uh, the Minister did um, nod vigorously when we talked about that, and I'm sure she will mention that in her closing remarks. And also to my colleague Gillian Mackay, who mentioned the important point about cost for people living across rural Scotland, but also that quite that sensitive part where someone may be worried about exposure before they're ready to do that if they have to access something um, in a very rural community. So all these points are so important. I would also like to thank Joel Fitzpatrick um, for bringing that hope in his constituency about where we might go with this. And that is a really important point for us all that we must seek to make sure we're talking about where there is a uh, success. Many members in the chamber um, talked about stigma today, which is so important. And this morning, I listened on the radio um, to Waverley Care, who were talking about this. And although it's incumbent, incumbent on the Scottish Government to do something about this, it is about everyone in the chamber. Um, and we all have a responsibility to act. Um, and we have called, and, and Waverley called, and it's just so great that the Minister today has said that they are going to have this anti-stigma campaign. Um, Emma Roddick um, painted a, a, a picture about history on this one and Brian Whittle raised a number of people that in my lifetime stood up and were counted um, and it is an important fact um, because Dr uh, Gohani mentioned and others the petrifying um, advertising um, that went on in, in my lifetime in the 80s and so it is so important that we get this campaign right and I hope the Minister might mention that uh, again um, Scottish Labour shares the view of the government laid out to reduce transmission to zero by 2030. Um, and as my colleague Paul Kane discussed, this is why our amendment calls on the government to outline a clear timescale for eliminating HIV transmission in Scotland by 2030 and commit to providing the Scottish Parliament with an annual progress report, as others have mentioned. And again, I think the Minister will hopefully um, support the motion there because it is about how we are seeking to get there that we can make the biggest difference. I can also thank my colleague Claire Baker. I think it's really important that when we're talking about this, we talk about the various transmission routes that we have and about other action plans that may come together to help us to get where we need. Um, given the havoc this disease sort of wrought so, you know, for so long, it is incredible to think that we could reach the stage where it is both under control and potentially no longer being transmitted at all. Um, and it was so unthinkable not so long ago. And I can't be begin to imagine the extent of the work and dedication that went into that and in achieving that in terms of the research and also people who really um, made us stand up and, and be aware so that we pushed and pushed on, on these facts. I want to come back also to uh, Gillian Martin's point and Richard Leonard's point about across the world. Uh, the reality in many other parts of the world is stark. Um, and I believe that Scotland and the wider UK has a responsibility to alleviate the suffering many are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And to do that, we must continue to play a lead role in the fight against AIDS um, for generations to come, passing on the hard-won knowledge we have gathered um, to the rest of the world. Um, and that begins with pushing against the damaging rhetoric coming from some quarters about foreign aid funding should reduce the vast benefits of foreign aid has seen millions able to survive with HIV and continue to live a prosperous existence in their communities. Um, and it, it reinforces our role across the globe. And we must not cut our efforts on that, as we've heard by both Gillian and, and Richard about the, 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 the way in which others live in other countries. If I can just come back to uh, research, innovation and research must remain key. And the introduction of PrEP has 
been a remarkable positive in this regard, um, alongside a focus on prevention, specialist care and uh, contact tracing that promotes a modern and considered approach to tackling the problem. Um, I thought it was uh, important that I, in the closing remarks that I did mention Alex Cole Hamilton's um, wish for the Minister to, to speak about some of the areas that have very long waits, such as in Lothian, and how they hope to tackle that. In concluding, Deputy Presiding Officer, if we can make, can maintain the current tra trajectory and ensure this accountability, we will be going a long way to improving the lives of thousands of people at home, and no doubt m many more abroad. This can only be good and we can do this and I hope cross party we can work together because this is so essential that we make a difference globally with HIV and AIDS. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call on Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a privilege to close this debate for the Scottish Conservatives. Sadly, I do remember the early 1980s, uh, when the first cases of AIDS were discovered. I was a teenager at the time. I was around 16. Looking back, I don't think I fully grasped the gravity of what was happening at the time. I couldn't possibly have imagined that in 1981, an estimated 40 million people would lose their lives to AIDS-related illnesses in the decades following the first diagnosis. Paul O'Kane has said today, we stand in solidarity with those who are living with AIDS. But as Claire Baker has pointed out as well, we cannot be satisfied with the progress. Brian Whittle has, has highlighted several heroes, Magic Johnson, Freddie Mercury, Gareth Thomas, Thomas. To have lost so many lives is heartbreaking, but, to, but so too is the awful truth that many were stigmatized and shamed before they died because of their illnesses and all too often they chose because of ho who they chose to love. And sadly, as my colleague Jamie Green pointed out today, there are still parts of the world where infections are arising because people are afraid to go for a test or seek treatment for fear of retribution. Whether my colleague likes it or not, uh, Gilead developed 11 antiretrovirals that treated over 16, 16 million people. So I say to Mr. Leonard that without their funding, many HIV charities would, would be now non-existent yeah. and so many lives would have been lost. For many years, HIV and AIDS were vectors of social prejudice. They were lightning rods for bigotry, homophobia and discrimination. And while attitudes have changed over time, they've not changed enough. Shaming and fear-inducing tactics are often used to change behaviour, but the HIV stigma of the 1980s and 1990s still looms large. And data released earlier this year by the Terence Higgins Trust shows that public attitudes on HIV are still stuck in the 1980s. Joe Fitzpatrick referenced the terrible stigma, which was the main theme of his speech. Stigma can stop people from getting tested, as we know, but according to the National AIDS Trust, roughly one in 16 people living with HIV in the UK do not know they have the virus. Gillian Martin quoted alarming statistics that there is still a huge stigma and hurtful stereotyping. And as we've heard today, testing is pivotal, and so is addressing the barriers that prevent people from getting tested. My colleague Jamie Green stressed, when in doubt, test, and I do commend you for your courage for posting the testing video. Gillian Mackay highlighted underlying issues of division, disparity, and she said disregard. And it's a huge issue when it comes to eradicating, as she said, barriers to progress. As the Scottish Conservatives Amendment emphasises, timely access to sexual health services is so, so important. Dr. Sandesh Gulhani stressed the importance of a well-functioning sexual health service. Paul O'Kane has cautioned a postcode lottery, and Alex Cole Hamilton and Jamie Green and Emma Roddick have made calls to improve access to treatment services in rural areas, including in the Highlands. And if someone does get tested and receives a positive diagnosis, HIV stigma means they can feel isolated and alone when they're most vulnerable. I was struck by a comment made by Nathaniel J. Hall, who starred in the TV, TV series we 
highlighted today, it's a sin. He was diagnosed with AIDS at just 16. Nathaniel said, there's a lot of working through all that shame of being gay and trying to unpick all that homophobia. And he'd internalized that. And then it came to the other thing. I'd contracted the virus. I didn't tell anyone, he said. I didn't tell my friends, my family. I told very few friends until about 2017. Imagine being 16 years old, being given a life-shortening diagnosis, which is what it was at the time, and trying to cope with it alone. Imagine trying to do that while dealing with decades of bigotry that makes you believe that because you were gay, there's something wrong with you. Presiding officer, we need to keep working towards the goal of zero transmission by 2030. We also need to aim for zero stigma, so rightly pointed to, out today by Emma Roddick. We need to provide the mental health support to people with a diagnosis of HIV and AIDS if they need it. With early diagnosis and treatment, people with HIV can lead a normal life. So I welcome the announcement today by the Minister of a public awareness campaign but no one should feel as though they must go through it alone. This is about emotional health as well as physical health. Many of us in the chamber today are wearing our Red AIDS ribbons. They were first introduced 30 years ago at the height of the AIDS crisis by the Visual AIDS Art Artist Caucus in the United States. In 1992, actress Elizabeth Taylor wore a red ribbon to the Oscars and it became an internationally renowned symbol of compassion, support, awareness and hope. She dedicated so much of her life to AIDS activism, even though she was warned that it was one of her lame duck causes that could hurt her professionally. She stuck her head above the parapet over and over again as governments the world over scrambled to come up with a coherent public health response. As Mary Todd and Dr. Sandesh Kulhani emphasized, with advancements in medical treatment, a diagnosis is no longer a death sentence. Antiretroviral medicines can effectively reduce the viral load to undetectable levels, and PrEP can prevent HIV if taken properly. We've come so far since the red ribbon first became embedded in our collective consciousness as a symbol of solidarity and hope. The UK has met and surpass the UN 1990 target. There's been a huge reduction in HIV transmission in the UK and in Scotland, but the fight to end AIDS isn't over yet. Thank you. Thank you, and I call on Marie Todd to wind up, up to 5 p.m., Minister. Thank you very much. Oh my goodness, I thank members for their participation in this incredibly important debate. I'm very glad of the consensus and support that I am feeling across the chamber on this issue and I'm pleased to confirm that the government is very happy to support both of the opposition amendments today. Today is a stark reminder that although there has been huge advances in treatment and diagnostic tools in recent years, that virus has not gone away and the stigma surrounding an HIV diagnosis persists, and far too many people have died and will continue to die. In Scotland, we've made tremendous progress, as I set out in my opening speech, but we cannot and must not become complacent. I'm determined that we build upon our successes, and I'm grateful that the work that has gone into this elimination proposal will help us to do that. I have every faith that the HIV uh, Transmission Elimination Strategy Implementation Group will continue to drive momentum and to deliver real, tangible results. Now, I won't repeat the detail of my opening remarks, but I hope that the announcements made today demonstrate the commitment that this government has to eliminating HIV transmission within Scotland by 2030 and to ensuring that those living with HIV are able to live long and healthy lives free from stigma and discrimination. I'm going to um, try to respond to many of the issues that were raised during the debate. Jamie Green opened by reflecting on the sadness but also the hopefulness of today and, and I know that members around the chamber share that sense of being on the cusp 
of something really momentous. Um, and I am absolutely delighted to be Public Health Minister at this moment in time in Scotland. I commend him for his work in this area, particularly that publicly testing and using his position of power to tackle lead, uh, stigma. Um, I did announce the commitment to widen access to the ePrep pilot, which I hope will improve access to PrEP for all of those living in remote and in rural areas. Um, but I also hope that that will have an impact in urban areas. Um, I, I have to draw an analogy between the development in that service uh, with some of the advances that we've had in telemedical access to early medical abortion, for example, at home. That's one of the few positives that I can see has come from the pandemic. And our sexual health teams with that advance have demonstrated their ability to be agile and to change the way that they deliver care and also enhance their person-centred focus. And I think, you know, there's so many clinicians around the country and teams that have worked in this area for so long that we need to be very grateful for. Certainly. Jamie Green. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very intrigued by the detail of it, and I hope the Minister will share that when, when she can with other members. But there are two very important things that face-to-face -face contact does provide the remote and e-pilots do not. One is that if someone does receive a positive diagnosis, they will need that one-to-one -one, uh, per uh, personal um, interaction with, with somebody who knows what they're talking about. The other is obviously those who are taking PrEP are also tested for many other things, uh, often due to, due to their, their, you know, other sexual behaviours. So I wonder if that will be addressed as well, because there's no replacement for that physical going into sexual health services, which for too often, too many, simply isn't available when they need it. Minister. So, so certainly more than happy to provide detail as we develop it and that's what the uh, Labour Party amendment asked for and I'm more, ha more than happy to keep the Chamber updated. Um, I, I, as a remote and rural MSP I've heard directly from constituents who have been given very difficult news in the circumstances where they've had to travel alone a very long distance, often a flight to a hospital to be given that news alone and actually who have said to me I would rather have had that news by telemedicine in the comfort of my own home with support and family around me. So I think that illustrates that we need to work in a person-centred way. There isn't one size fits all in this particular debate. And I trust as much as I, you know, the sexual health um, people working in those clinics are absolutely phenomenal at working in that person-centred way without judgment and certainly without prejudgment, without assumption, and day in, day out get those decisions right alongside the people that they care for. Um, Paul O'Kane talked very eloquently about the homophobia and moral panic that has absolutely been front and centre of this AIDS debate since this since the HIV v virus first burst onto um, the scene and into our lives. Um, as the Minister with responsibility for the blood donor system, I am absolutely delighted that he's giving blood. Every donation saves three, up to three lives. So thank you. And thank you too for using your position of power to tackle stigma um, and to lead the way. Um, a number of people asked for more detail of the pilot. Now, the pilot will probably necessarily, because we're trying to gain results from it, um, be limited to a certain geographical area. We're still developing it. But actually, the service that we develop on the back of that pilot will be targeted at those people who are able to self-manage rather than geographically targeted. So it will potentially when the final service is developed, help both rural and urban areas. Gillian Martin and others asked about women, and I absolutely acknowledge that there's much more to be done. The educational resources that will be available to clinicians as part of the widening access to PrEP will highlight that it's not only gay and bisexual men who are at risk of um, acquiring HIV. It is about risk profile, not gender. And Evelyn Tweed actually gave some incredible statistics um, highlighting the very worrying and persistent idea that some people have that they are not the type of person who might catch HIV. That is another very powerful argument for a marketing campaign, if ever we needed one. Um, Emma Roddick, as ever, gave a beautiful and powerful speech on this topic um, and should definitely use statistics more often. I think that stating that 
people with HIV have half the chance of being kissed is a powerful way of describing the lingering ignorance and the impact of stigma. Dr Galhani talked eloquently about the medical advances over time. Um, I often uh, compare nowadays, I mean, nowadays HIV is, is, is significantly less fatal than smoking, for example, which um, is still quite a common pastime and will kill two thirds of those people who do it. It's no longer the, the fatal disease that it once was. Um, Joe Fitzpatrick took the opportunity, as ever, to highlight the fabulous work going on in Tayside to tackle both HIV and their world-leading work um, on tackling Hep C. And I want to take the opportunity to commend him for his work while he was in this role. And I know that he shares my absolute thrill at having been part of this exciting moment in history. That goal of elimination is in sight. Um, he took the opportunity, as I would expect from a past public health minister too, to reiterate that vitally important message. People on effective treatment cannot pass on the virus. And if there is one message that comes out of this debate today, that will be a powerful message to see replicated in all our media tonight and, and tomorrow. Claire Baker was absolutely right to highlight the effort that's required to reduce the risk for people who inject drugs. The Scottish Government has um, funded numerous projects that were designed to identify and enlist in treatment those people who have acquired HIV in that population. For example, last um, year we funded the Cocoon Project, which is a project that provides person-centred approach to people who inject drugs and are at risk of poor sexual health, bloodborne viruses and increased mortality. And that project provided a point of care, P BBV testing and treatment, as well as testing for other diseases, COVID-19 and other STIs. And the main aim of that project was to provide that holistic service that combines all care at a single point, whilst integrating <coughs> wound care, naloxone provision and other harm reducing measures. And I think that's just one example of certainly. Claire Baker. Thank you. Um, in the speech, I mentioned Matt Standard 4, which is the one that was about uh, BBV testing. Uh, can she give me assurances that she is speaking with uh, Angela Constance, the Minister, and that they are speaking regularly with ADPs about delivery on this, which has to be done by April? Uh, absolutely. And I have regular um, catch-ups with Angela Constance, and absolutely that would be a very high priority for both of us. Um, Gillian Mackay, well, I was shocked to learn that my esteemed colleague was born whilst I was at university. <laughs> Wisdom in one so young, um, just astonishing. Uh, very pleased to confirm that we are considering a HIV testing week as part of that marketing campaign. Um, I, as a mum of three, have been tested three times. I would have absolutely no qualms about being tested again, and I'm sure many around the chamber would join that campaign should we decide that was the best way forward. Um, Brian Whittle and myself um, share that absolute passion for sport and believe in the power of sport to change the world. So it's no um, surprise that I commend, along with him, those sporting heroes like Gareth Thomas, who are using that public position to counter stigma. Um, I also share much of the concern that Richard Leonard expressed. Um, Whilst we're focused here today on eliminating HIV in Scotland, we must not forget that HIV is only manageable with access to the right treatment at the right time and unequal access to HIV antivirals costs life. And we know that the disruption to health services caused by COVID is likely to have made inequality worse. It's estimated that in 2021, over 38 million people around the world had HIV. Um, and of those, 16% had not been tested and didn't even know their status. That's over 6 million people, over 9 million people waiting to start antiviral treatments. We can and we must end this, first and foremost, because we can never expect, accept any life lost needlessly. But secondly, we're a connected global community and nowhere is safe until everywhere is. And we continue to forget that at great cost to ourselves. To answer both Carol Mochen and uh, Alec Cole Hamilton, I'm aware that in August this year, NHS Lothian have recruited additional staff to increase the number of clinics and to reduce the waiting times for patients to start PrEP. Presiding officer, 
I'm extremely grateful for this debate this afternoon. I want to say thank you to all of us here in the Chamber today, but I also want to commend and say thank you to the stakeholders, the key stakeholders, many of whom are in the Chamber today, HIV, Scotland, Waverley Care and the Terence Higgins Trust. Now, these organisations have been working in this field forever and, and, and at the, well, for decades. Beginning in any era when it was much tougher to stand up and speak out than it is now, and I am so grateful to be working with you all today. I know that the Chamber will be unified to support to end HIV transmissions within Scotland by 2030, and it is that unified, collaborative approach that will ensure that we reach that target and better the lives of those living with HIV in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on World AIDS Day. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, and there are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is that Amendment 7025.2 in the name of Jamie Green, which seeks to amend Motion 7025 in the name of Marie Todd on World AIDS Day, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that Amendment 7025.1 in the name of Paul O'Kane, which seeks to amend Motion 7025 in the name of Marie Todd on World AIDS Day, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion, the amendment, sorry, is therefore agreed. And the final question is that Motion 7025 in the name of Marie Todd, as amended on World AIDS Day, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. That concludes decision time and I close this meeting. <laughs>